Do not copy paste from other materials directly into your paper. Do not rely on direct quotes. Do not utilize patchwork paraphrasing and simply put, do not plagiarize. The easiest way to avoid all of that is to simply not copy paste any materials. Whew. Okay, with that out of the way, I figured I would just say the most important thing up front. Today's video is just a brief overview of authentic writing practices in the social sciences, specifically for psychology. And specifically, this is built as a response to some of the common problems I've seen in students' papers and essays over the past several years. So I thought I would talk briefly about what to use to write your psychology assignment, how to use it, and what to avoid. So I'll try to be very quick here. What to use. In most of my classes, I am most often asking students to rely on empirical resources. And what I mean by this is journal articles published in peer-reviewed psychology journals, which are the original source of novel data from subjects. So what I mean is the report or article is summarizing a study that was conducted. They collected data from participants of some kind even if it's just one participant, right? Like in a case study, that counts. If it's 100,000 participants in some giant nationally representative sample, that's also great, right? But I'm referring to articles that report on the initial analysis of data collected. The easiest way to know if you're looking at an empirical article, according to my definition of an empirical article, is to check the abstract for whether there is a methods section. And ideally, the methods section would come right out and say the sample size was this. Uh, you know, 500 subjects completed our survey, or 1,000 participants um, participated in our experiment, right? So that would tell you there was data collected. The journals that you should be looking for, uh, there are many, but some names that really float to the top would include the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, a uh, great fit for a lot of the projects you might be working on. Uh, the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology is another great fit. And there are many, many slightly more specific journals that vary from topic to topic. So Traumatology is a great journal for the study of PTSD and trauma-related psychology. Suicidology or Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior is another one for depression and suicidal issues. Uh, there are many, many different options out there, right? But the seal of approval that you should be looking for is that it's a peer-reviewed journal which publishes psychology articles and that the article you're looking at has a sample size of some kind. That would mean that it meets my criteria for an empirical resource. There are many, many things which do not meet those criteria and yet might be informative and might be good for the general public, right? Things like Wikipedia, things like WebMD, the NIMH website, Mayo Clinic, right? There are a plethora of resources out there that are not bad per se, but they're not the original source of scientific findings, which you should be using for the writing that you're doing in a psychological science class. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I made another video which gives a demonstration of how to utilize the psychology databases and that's what you'll be going through to get access to these articles that I'm referring to. So don't just start with Google or Bing, don't just get on the computer and start looking around. You want to go to Psych Articles or Psych Info, the databases, to be searching for these articles. The one that's called Psych Info is broader and it'll search a whole host of options including books, journal articles, dissertations, and theses, and it'll be from all sorts of different publishers. The one called Psych Articles will only search APA journals and it'll only bring up results that have an immediate PDF available for you to download. So there are pros and cons to both, right? From Psych Info, you'll get a much wider array of options, but some of them might not be immediately available and you'll have to request it through our library and it might take a couple days for you to get it. Psych Articles is immediately available, but it's a much narrower set of journals that you're looking through. Okay, but both have their merit. Experiment with both and see what you can find for the project that you're working on. Okay, so that's what to use. I want you to be relying on empirical sources the vast majority of the time, right? And if I'm occasionally asking you for something different, 
I'll, I'll spell that out in the instructions, right? A common assignment that I use is to have students to look for an example of a psychological concept in everyday media, like somebody tweeting about depression, for instance, but I will specifically say in the instructions for that project, these are the kinds of things that you can look for. Most of the time, term papers, research papers, I want students to be relying on empirical resources, studies that have a sample size. Okay, how to use the resources that you're collecting. Simply put, you're gonna be following APA style, right? So get your APA style manual out and look through it and read through all the details and follow the instructions. A full walkthrough of everything that is APA style would not fit in the scope of this quick video, but I'll mention a few things here that students sometimes get tripped up on. First, you wanna make sure that there is an in-text citation to match every reference in your paper and vice versa, that there's a reference to match every in-text citation. And together, what these do is that they leave a trail of breadcrumbs for your readers to be able to know where did you get your info. If you make some claim about uh, the prevalence of schizophrenia or about how neuroticism and death anxiety are correlated, the reader needs to be able to know where did they get that info, right? Because this is not just an opinion piece. You are writing a summary or a culmination of the psychological science that's out there, okay? Um, so that's what in-text citations and references are for. Sometimes students aren't really comfortable initially with how to use them, and they'll either be a little over-inclusive and they might stick an in-text citation at the end of every sentence, which is overkill, or they'll do this thing I see pretty often where they won't include one until the end of every paragraph. Both of those are problematic, right? You don't want to be taking up unnecessary space. Let's say you're talking about one study for seven sentences in a row. There's no reason to cite that study seven times in a row, right? On the other hand, you don't want to be giving a lot of info and leaving the reader wondering where did this come from and then not citing until the very end of the paragraph. So what I like to recommend for students is sort of a bookend system. Include an in-text citation at the first mention of new information that comes from that reading and then cap it again at the end if you've used more than just a couple sentences about it, right? So that the, the reader knows this is the beginning and end of where I was discussing that material. Another thing students sometimes wonder is, can I use first person pronouns, right? Can I say I and me and we in a paper? APA style dictates that that is okay, but the focus should always be on the science, right? So you shouldn't be saying, I thought this was interesting, or I think this, or I think this. That's not entirely necessary. You can just say, these findings were fascinating, right? Um, but what sometimes is useful, for instance, if you're writing up a research report for a study that you conducted, you can say we in the methods section, for instance. So we collected subjects by doing blah, blah, blah. We analyzed our data by doing blah, 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 right? Which is, that's first person. Um, because otherwise, if you are trying to avoid pronouns, you would have to flip it around and use passive voice, right? So an ANOVA was conducted is, is passive voice and just sounds a little funky. It's just simpler for you to say as the researcher, we did this, we did this, we found this, we conclude this. And so if you're writing a term paper, similarly, it's okay to use first person pronouns. You just wanna keep the focus upon the science and not upon the authors, right? So there's a little bit of an emphasis shift there. The last thing I'll mention about APA style is an acknowledgement that it can be a little bit complicated for students to get accustomed to how to fill in the references section. So there are some minor differences between say books and journal articles and other sorts of resources for how you'll put it all together, like where the authors go, where the year goes, the page numbers, which parts are italicized. So just make sure that you're checking the unit in the manual that has examples because they have uh, a ton of different examples for you to look at. Just basically go off of those like a template. And that's how you're providing to the reader uh, a quick view of what is this resource that I'm referring to and how could I get it if I wanna read it for myself. Oftentimes that reader is me, but if you do some paper that you're really proud of and you wanna be publishing it, you want all of those readers to be able to find the background and resources for any of the claims you're making. Okay, so the short answer for how to use the resources you're collecting is that you're gonna be writing it up in APA style, scientific tone, professional review of what you've learned. Okay. 
Lastly, and pretty importantly, I want to make some commentary on things to avoid in your homework assignments, essays, and term papers. And again, this is based on patterns of what I see students struggling with over the recent years. First, I want to point out again that you should avoid copy-pasting. It's really tempting, right? So you have this assignment that says, tell me about the etiology of generalized anxiety disorder, or tell me about this particular treatment for depression, right? And you find an article that just perfectly describes the thing you're trying to find, and your gut instinct says, well, I'll just copy that and I'll put it in my paper, and I'll, I'll fix it later. Avoid that, right? The first thing you should be doing is taking notes. So just jot down in your own words a summary of what you learned from reading the article. And then when you go back later to work on the final draft of your paper, you take those notes that you made and you transfer those into the paper. Putting just one step between the original resource and your final work submission helps eliminate, I don't know, 99.9% .9 of any plagiarism problems that I tend to see. What happens pretty often when students get caught plagiarizing is that they copy-pasted and forgot to go back and put it in their own words, or didn't really understand it quite well enough to be able to rephrase it or conceptualize it in a new way, so they just left it as is, right? And then that leaves me as the instructor unsure of whether you've really learned about it or not, and I just want to know what you've learned. Again, I'll reiterate that I want to hear things in your own words. It's not that important that you are super eloquent with your writing. It's not that important that you are using GRE vocab that would be expected of a tenured professor who's publishing their, you know, 100th article, right? You're in college. You're here to learn. So learn and show me what you've learned and don't be ashamed of it. Write in your own words. Other things to avoid would include direct quotes. And again, this is somewhat specific to my classes and how I teach, but I really discourage students from relying on direct quotes. The best general rule is to just not use any quotes in your papers at all and write everything in your own words. That's the best way for me to know what you've learned. Sometimes an occasional direct quote is an appropriate thing to do when you're really highlighting the tone of something or something was just written in a really poignant way and you wanted to showcase that. Or, for instance, you want to show an example item from a in an instrument that you're using, like an assessment of, of something. Uh, sometimes in assignments, I'll ask students to describe the assessment measure that would be used to um, quantify a particular construct, like, say, depression. And so they'll say, oh, item one of the Beck Depression Inventory is blah, blah, blah. And that's an appropriate time to showcase a quote, right? Because you're showing me that you actually found it and read through it in detail. Other times when quotes might be appropriate would be, like I mentioned earlier, that I'll occasionally have students do like a critical thinking exercise where they're looking at popular media. So maybe you quote a tweet and you say, in this tweet from this Twitter user, they misunderstood schizophrenia because of blah blah, right? That's an easy way for you to show me what it is that you're criticizing. Without quoting it, I would have a little more of a hard time knowing what you're referring to. Song lyrics might be something worth quoting, again, if you're trying to pull some psychological content from it. But what I really, really don't want students to be doing is plucking, you know, three, four, five sentences at a time from the results section of a paper, simply because it was easier than putting it into their own words and their own understanding. Really, most of the time, don't quote anything from journal articles, because it's just not appropriate. You can be quoting things from popular culture to showcase it for the reader, and occasionally direct quotes for things like assessment instruments are going to be appropriate. Read my instructions closely. I'll tell you what I'm looking for. By and large, no quotes, and that'll make things the easiest for you to avoid any trouble. One last thing to point out about what to avoid in writing for psychology courses, especially mine, is that you want to avoid a high score on the Turnitin Similarity Index. I use this in a number of my classes. What this refers to is verbiage that matches other phrases or sentences that are out there in journal articles or websites. Now, no one is going to have a 0% uh, Turnitin Similarity Index because inevitably you're going to have some phrases that match other things that are out there. The, the names of some of the disorders that we study are, are three, or four three or four words long, so that's going to be something that'll 
begin to look like a phrase that matches things, right? So if you were to say something like the etiology of borderline personality disorder involves, you know, a little phrase like that is probably going to match some papers that are out there. I'm pretty used to seeing that. I'm pretty used to seeing low percentages that are just coincidence, and that's fine. What I'm talking about are phrases of slightly more length, sometimes two, three, four sentences in a row that are all lit up and they clearly match some other existing material that's out there. It's a clear sign that it was copy pasted. So again, just avoid that. You wanna keep your similarity index pretty low because that shows me you're, again, writing from your own mind, explaining things in your own words and it comes out in a unique way. It's not a perfect met metric. Uh, I understand that there are some problems with Turnitin. Um, that's okay. It, it's a system that helps us detect problems in authentic writing. Um, I use it in conjunction with also reading your paper closely and getting a feel for myself of whether it's in your own words or if you're relying too much on other sources. But again, as a general rule, you want to keep that score low. It helps show me that you wrote in your own words. Okay, so avoid that. So, quick recap. Don't copy-paste. Write in your own words. Explain things with your own thoughts, even if it doesn't come out in a very eloquent or perfectly clean kind of way. Just show me what you learned. Use APA style. Check your manual if you have any questions about how to format things. And reach out to me if you have any questions about how to do things. Don't get lost and uncertain about how to succeed in your writing and then resort to plagiarism or pseudo-cheating efforts to try and make it work. Just ask for help, go visit the writing center, ask me for help, ask a classmate to review your paper. Do what you can to have your writing be as clean and easily understood as possible, and that'll avoid the vast majority of problems. One last tip, before you hit submit, before you send that paper off to me, read it to yourself out loud. That'll really help you catch the remaining awkwardness or goofiness in transitions between ideas. And if you find yourself stumbling over your own words, imagine someone else trying to read it. Right, so read it out loud before you submit it and that'll help you clean it up. I hope this quick talk was useful and helps you dodge some of the problems that other students have encountered. I want your writing to be as solid as possible. Okay, have a great day.